when your parent has cancer and, and when you're going to bed at night and when you're in your room and, and you think that the world has left you alone, you, you are just out in the wilderness in this unknown disease that you can't explain because it's sometimes the doctors doesn't ever seem like they can explain it. And it just leaves you really confused sometimes. And Camp Custom is just is important because you, it makes you understand that not only is it okay to sometimes be confused, but it's okay to have fun and it's okay to cherish the good times that you have and understand that even though that there's darkness in our world and that there's cancer in our world, there's other people that are dealing with it that are gonna help us to get through it. After camp, before camp, it's a big difference, a very big difference. There is no love that is like Camp Cousin Love because it is just so unique. It, there's no judgment and you can come here and you can be yourself and you can talk to other people who have been through nearly exactly what you've been through. When I'm at Camp Cousin, I'm the happiest person I've ever been that whole year. It's so much better than I would have ever expected. Like I didn't expect to feel like this just like atmosphere of happiness and like positivity, even though we're all like fighting cancer, like in our own way. Camp magic is this feeling in your chest that you can't contain. It, it like has to come out of you. It's it's just there. It's it's in you. All right. It's it's here. It's in your heart. It's really honestly not about cancer here. It's about loving each other and bringing each other up. This is a special place. It's home for me and other kids, so, yeah. This week on Inside the Headset, we are featuring Lake Erie College head coach Riley Murphy. Coach Murphy discusses his different experiences coaching at various college levels, provides insight on how to turn a struggling program around, and highlights the culture of accountability he has created within his team. Now, let's get inside the headset with Coach Murphy. Coach, what's going on? Thanks for joining us today. How are you? Doing great, Coach. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you and uh, excited to kind of get things going today. Yeah, no doubt, man. Well, let's let's dive right on in here. Um, you've had a, a very unique background in coaching. Um, you you kind of checked a lot of different boxes. You've been at public, private, HBCUs. You know, now that you're in this head coaching role there at Lake Erie, how has some of these unique opportunities that all differ very, very much from each other? How how, how has that varied experience, uh, variety of experiences helped prepare you for the role that you have today? Yeah, yeah, I, I'd say, you know. Uh, being in places where, you know, I've been in uh, Notre Dame College where, you know, we've been in a big city and that's uh, something that uh, can be a positive, you know. Uh, then also been in towns like Silver City, New Mexico, where we call Walmart the mall, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, been at an NAI school of Bethel, Kansas, where, you know, we had about a 400 kids on campus. So, you know, we were one-fourth of the school, small town, Kansas. Um, and, you know, the, the one thing that, is the common theme is if you treat your players well, you know that they, they trust you and they know that you're going to work as hard as you're asking them to work for you. Um, you know, you're going to get results. You know, uh, you know, the, the last experience at Fayetteville state working for coach Hayes, uh, HBCU as an offensive coordinator. Um, it was a, an amazing experience. And again, it's just finding those things that you'll stand for and being authentic with your players you know, because that's the biggest thing that I think uh, has led to the successes that I've had at those other stops. Um, because, you know, I think the kids can tell right away if you're not being real with them. Right. And uh, if if that's something that you can carry through and, you know, be uh, be somebody that they can trust and lean on, that you're, you're going to be in good shape no matter where you're at. You know, uh, no matter what level, what school you're at, where you're at in the country. Um, and those things, uh, I definitely – have prepared me for this opportunity. No doubt. Now, let me ask you a uh, kind of follow-up question there. You know, I, I had this uh, one school I worked at where 
when kids came on a recruiting visit, this is kind of more of a recruiting question in relation mm-hmm. to some of the spots that you were at where they all differ. Um, you know, and I'm sure more than just the kids on campus facilities, I'm sure it had vast differences, things like that. And, you know, we, we were at this one place where we literally, literally meet on how when a kid landed, you know, got into our city, how we would drive them, you know, literally the strategic way we would drive them. So they didn't go by the rough parts that, you know, <laughs> you know, normally that you see when you're driving to campus, you know, you're trying to be very strategic about, Hey, when they're in, when they're in our facilities, we don't take them down this hallway. It smells like, you know, back yeah. back crap because we got bats stuck in the attic over there. You know, those, those types of things that you have, like when you're at some of these unique places how, how do you go about recruiting and strategizing to make sure that you show your best parts but also be honest about some some of the warts or flaws that you might have and you know that's awesome coach because you know you can tell you've been right there you know and uh i've learned you know as a young coach you know i, I was like very let's put our front foot forward you know let's sell the heck out of this weekend and um you know and, and i have now changed to where you know showing the goods and I think that's important because, you know, you you can win them on a visit, but you might lose them the first week if they are not fully prepared about the opportunity that they're looking in. And um, because I've come to realize any opportunity is a blessed opportunity, Absolutely. you know, and, uh, you know, so those, uh, those, you know, things that can be a, a drawback, I think it's a, it's a good thing to address it right away because it might be, you know, might beat you you know, six months down the road when those are the things that ended up scaring them off in the first place. And you could have had something else that was more fully prepared and, you know, ready for this opportunity. Because I think uh, for NAI, Division Two, FCS football, I mean, really all levels uh, that I've been a part of or seen, you got to love the game and you got to really be ready for the opportunity. And it's got to be something that, um, you know, you're football driven and you're academically driven. That's why you're there. Right. uh, Yeah. So that's kind of something I've kind of learned through the years, you know, with those different stops and, uh, you know, but also, you know, highlighting what you're good at. And those are things hopefully that come easy because that's what you believe in and, you know, that's what you're doing. Yeah, uh, no doubt, man. I had a buddy I work with and he he would always say, man, if this guy's going to choose us because – or not choose us because we don't have different color helmets, it's probably not the guy we want anyways. And, uh, you know, sometimes, like you said, it's just been upfront and honest with – yeah, you know, this we have an issue with our locker room. It's not as big as what we want, but if the size of the locker room, the square footage is going to be the reason you choose us or choose somebody else, then then like you might not be our right kid anyway. So we'd rather lose you in the recruiting process than have you come here and decide that a year later, you know, put you behind in, in positions and things like that. Now, uh, you know, once again, just talking about some of your experiences, you've, you've been a key player in several programs, beginnings and turnarounds, uh, you know, namely Notre Dame College, uh, uh, Bethel College, uh, Bethel College, excuse me, and then uh, most recently Lake Erie, your, your current job. Have you always been attracted to these types of situations? And, uh, you know, I, I, I've been around people that kind of see the beauty and, you know, not necessarily just getting handed the big stick and being a big dog on campus. I mean, right. you know, I, I won't say everybody can win in that situation, but, you know, maybe, maybe having something to work towards and, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that light down the end of the tunnel that you're really trying to grind to. And what has been some of your keys to success in these turnarounds is kind of a two-part question there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, kind of say, the, uh, like, some of the stops just to illustrate a little bit about Notre Dame College, you know, was uh, first opportunity. You know, I was, uh, you know, had a shot to play a little bit after school, you know, got hurt, got cut, and didn't know what to do. Um, you know, so I decided to get into law school and, uh, you know, was almost couldn't even watch football, to be honest with you. And then got a call out of nowhere about uh, junior college. Uh, coach uh, kind of brought me in. I wasn't even thinking about coaching. And so it led me to this opportunity at Notre Dame College where, you know, I, I had to tell my fiance at the time, you know, we're, we're not going to be, you know, a lawyer in San Diego. I'm about to take this, you know, leap of faith here in uh, Notre Dame College. It used to be a women's school. And uh, we're, we're going to kind of try and build that thing up. And uh, a lot of the success that they've had, and I can't take much credit for, you know, I, I learned a lot from them in my time there. And, you know, uh, when it led me to, you know, Bethel College, it was, frankly, it was probably the only opportunity I had that was going to give me the job and the chance to be the OC. And uh, so I wouldn't say I've been attracted to them, but I also have never been uh, afraid of that challenge. If it gives me an opportunity to kind of showcase on a higher level what I think I can help bring to a program. 
And, uh, you know, at Bethel, they were the worst offense in the country. And I think it scored five touchdowns the, the game, bef- the season before. And, uh, you know, we, we took a lot of pride in actually scoring more touchdowns than that first game and breaking the losing streak of a couple years, uh, <laughs> in that, that first game. But it, it was tough. And, uh, you know, but that gives you the, the, the conviction that, you know, you kind of have the right tools to, you know, go somewhere else and do it again. And, uh, here at Lake Erie College, we had a lot of that similar things. They were the worst offense in the country. Um, you know, I think it was 166 out of 166. Defense 163 out of 166, almost on a two-year losing streak. Um, and, you know, just looking at an outsider in, a lot of people get shot away from those opportunities, whether it was, uh, you know, these losing streaks or, you know, even, you know, going to an HBC, you know, those things that um, – when you feel strong about what, what you can do and uh, the people that surround you, you know, those have been the things that have helped us take those opportunities to, uh, you know, win more games this first year than the, the previous three years combined. And, you know, I think we're heading the right direction. But uh, in a roundabout answer, it's, it's those little steps, those little things that you've done at those other places that give you the, the confidence that you can do it again and maybe bite off a challenge that others might be uh, shied away from. No doubt. Well, um, I, I put this tweet out like four years ago, uh, and, and our social media guy decided to kind of keep running it because it was a very popular tweet. Every Saturday, 50% of the teams are going to win, 50% of them are going to lose. And so, right. you know, we, we tend to always highlight these teams that perform extremely well, not realizing that for every 12-0 and 0 team, there's a there's an 0-12 team. Every eleven right. and one, there's a one and eleven team, and so with a lot of guys, at least fifty percent of our, our of our coaches are in these programs where they're trying to rebuild, they're trying to, uh, you know, take that next step, you know, put them small pieces together, as you just mentioned. What kind of advice would you give to guys in those unique situations? Yeah, yeah, uh, it's, it's I talked with a, a buddy of mine that got a head coaching job recently, and you know they weren't uh, having a lot of success, and I think one thing that I learned is that right when you get a, a, an opportunity, whether you're the OC or, or you're a head coach or somewhere where you have a chance to really um, impact the program, they always talk about, well, what are you going to do different with recruiting? You know, and, uh, you know, get rid of guys, you know, and stuff like that. And I think that's been a, a common theme that I've heard at least. And I think that was something that I realized very early is that you've got to build up the players that are in the program. Uh, it, no matter what their record was before, um, you almost got to go re-recruit your team. And that's something that, you know, when I came here, some of our best players had already said they were leaving, you know, and uh, I think some coaches uh, could make a mistake by just saying, well, if they don't want to be here, they're gone. Well, there was a reason why they came here in the first place. And so those are things that I think uh, that alone could be one of the earliest things that you can do is to kind of build up the players you've been with because I know here – Specifically at Lake Erie, the, the 30 to 40 players that stayed after they went through that losing streak and, you know, all the bad things that kind of happened to them are some of the toughest kids that I've ever been around because they, you know, they, when others ran, they kind of stood up and, you know, dug their heels down and, you know, found a little bit of success that, you know, following year. And um, so that would be number one is uh, to kind of realize that the players that were playing last year, are, most of the time are going to find themselves on the field again for you. Um, you know, so that would be number one. And, you know, to elaborate more, you know, there, there's so many different things that when it comes to a turnaround project, when it comes to the, you know, expectations and, you know, accountability and all those type of things that, uh, we, I've kind of had a system that I've picked up and learned from others that I think have, you know, helped us, you know, help these guys on and off the field. Coach. One of the things uh, is kind of diving into something that uh, you know I found doing doing a little homework on you is uh, one of your first goals was to empower that student athlete and teach them uh, to hold one another account uh, accountable. You know, not necessarily just the coach trying to put their thumb down all the time, but you know, a player looking over in, in the weight room and and, and being um, confident and having enough courage to you know not necessarily you know, create a, a bunch of tension, but call out a teammate and, and, and mm-hmm. make sure they're pushing themselves as far as, as far as they can. Uh, you know, what are a few ways that you and your staff, you know, have taught them to hold each other accountable, especially with the year where it was just so crazy. It was so many opportunities for, 
for players to make bad decisions uh, in regards to this COVID protocol stuff that I'm sure you guys have to deal with there on your campus as well. You know, what what, what opportunities did you guys, uh, you know, present these student athletes to learn how to hold each other accountable, how to hold themselves accountable? Absolutely. Um, you know, and I, I can kind of break that into two things there. You know, number one, like you said, is, you know, empower the players. What I mean by that is a lot of us and a lot, a lot of our not only coaches but players – you know, their, their self-worth to the world sometimes is too much wrapped into how they are performing as an athlete. And so, like, when I got onto this campus, you could tell since they were getting their butt kicked on the field, they were letting that, you know, affect their social lives, you know, their academic lives, because their self-worth was not the same. And unfortunately, you know, trying to separate the two of, like, what you have in this world is not just only what you're doing on the field. And trying to like kind of reset that button, you know, that was the one thing that we did right away to kind of empower our players here and other places that I've been. And then the accountability thing, there, there's something that we've used uh, where it's called the, the 5 a.m. get right runs. And it, it's pretty, it's kind of like how it sounds. And I'll try and be very brief about it. And it, it, I think it really does promote accountability. And, uh, you know, we've got all these different, you know, uh, guidelines that we would like our players to be at practice, right? We want to be at, uh, you know, we want them to be at class checks and we want them to be at, uh, you know, study hall and all these things that we uh, have the expectations, which most, you know, almost every school in the country has. All right. But what, what the difference is for us is if you miss one of those things, you get a 5 a.m. get right run on Friday morning. And, um, you know, if I'm getting up at five in the morning, I'm not happy on Friday. So you're not going to. It's not going to be very fun for the player either. Um, so you get two of those. But the third time you get a 5 a.m. get right run, you now run and your position group runs with you. And uh, the, the fourth time, which is a lot, you know, if you don't show up to work four times, you might not be there anymore. So the fourth time that happens, actually the position group runs for you and you are now there watching them run uh, for you at 5 a.m. And then the last one, and we've gotten there one time is the team or the player that your position group kind of gets to decide if they're going to do the run for you or kind of vote for, vote you off the team. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed with the accountability, I knew it was kind of working as I've told this story a couple of times is my office is right next to the weight room. And uh, I'd only been here for a couple of weeks and we had had way too many 5 a.m. get right runs mm -hmm. and a player, I overhear him saying, Hey, you know, uh, you know, Johnny's not going to, Johnny better be at class, you know, because we're not doing that dang run for him again. And obviously there's some, uh, you know, self, you know, you're trying to help yourself there because you don't want to do the run. But also the, the fact that they're going to go to his dorm and pull him to class right. um, is something that shows that they don't want to be put in that position to vote you off the team. And, you know, the, those things where I don't have to do it and the players are now doing it, you know, that's something that I think uh, – is something that's really helpful accountability because it, it, that's the hardest thing moving forward. Some of these young men is, you know, some guys just want to stay in their own lane and they also don't want, like, if you start calling somebody out, you know, then they almost look like they're, you know, kissing butt to the coaches. Right. And so it's, how do you blend that where everybody wants to be a part of it? And, and it's, it's not a perfect science and we don't have it hundred percent perfect, perfected, but that was one thing that we've stayed with. And I think it's really helped with, uh, our player leadership and those type of things and, you know, attacking COVID, you know, maintaining those protocols during that time when it was so easy to, um, you know, you know, all these online classes, terrible, you know, it was really hard for us to kind of help these players through it. And, you know, the, the depression of kind of staying in your room more than you had to um, having that player leadership and accountability of where we felt like they could check on each other that helped with, some of the challenges, um, but it, it was a very, very trying year uh, with that. And it, but it does hold through for everything that we're trying to coach these players up for is that you know everyone wants to play in the NFL and everybody wants to do this, but the ultimate goal is when life hits you and you hit, you, can you hit back? You know, are you going to be able to leave here and be ready to be a good husband, a good father, and you know take on this crazy world and have the tools to do it? And you know the guys that were able to make it through this year. Um, you know, and stay good academically and athletically and all those things. It just shows a lot of self-discipline that, you know, you're, you're now going to have that other people in the workforce aren't going to have.
Absolutely. Yeah, I, I actually love the way you kind of kind of talked about that whole uh, 5 a.m. get right run and the, prog- the progressions of it. Um, you know, ultimately, every good team I have been on as a coach or every good team I have had the opportunity to witness, um, you know, you you see those guys on the on the football field. And, you know, sometimes that's the only part that you get to see where you're on the outside looking in. But, uh, you know, you, you see guys getting onto each other. They love each other to death, but they but they're, but they're willing to 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 address up here and say, "Hey, man, come on, let's go, do your job," um, you know. And and it it doesn't just start on the football field. And, you know, when you get guys saying, "Hey, man, let's go get that joker up, let's get him to class," because I'm not running, I don't want to. You know, it, it gives them that confidence to now go ahead and maybe have some of those tougher conversations with each other um, that not necessarily have to deal, deal with getting to class, but it might be on the field. It might be in the weight room. It might be, Hey dude, you shouldn't have been in that girl's room, you know, on a, on a date tonight. This is, this is, we're, we're in COVID protocol, man. And you know, you get sick. We, we can't play this game. You know what I'm saying? So it's, uh, Absolutely. it's just great. Just being able to, to, to roll that out like that. And, uh, really in that progressive way, not that first time, but it, it, it continues to build up to the point where it's the whole team. And that is reflective. I mean, you make decisions that affects more people than yourself, whether you're uh, a 23-year-old football player at Lake Erie or you're a 35-year-old man with with a wife and kids that depend on you. You make decisions. Other people, you know, do do have to live those consequences, unfortunately. Well, uh, Coach, you know, uh, one of the things that I absolutely loved uh, about you as I was kind of – Going through your thirty-five under thirty-five submission uh, was 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 this really decorated um, uh, stops all you know all over the country, all different levels, and you were continuing to get you know better opportunities. You were coming offensive coordinator from position coaches. You were you were bouncing around. Teams were having success, and you ultimately end up at this head coaching position. And uh, you know a lot of people are really interested in that that um, our committee how we select guys and really having that plethora of experience. Uh, you know, sometimes it you you might just end up at one place and get to progress there. It's not always one right way to get to the position that you're in, but you know, just seeing that 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 progression and ultimately end up at this head coach uh, was was a big chunk of the reason that you were selected in the 35 under 35. What was that number one? You know, having so much success as a young coach, why was that important for you to number one apply for such an elite group, and then number two, what was the honor of being selected to you, and what are you looking forward to to learning from this group? Yeah, yeah, and uh, can you? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the number one part? Yeah, just what what, what was the reasoning for you to apply? You already had a ton of oh, success. Yeah, yeah. That, that continuing education piece for a guy that's already a head coach at your age. You know what, what yeah. was so important for you to apply to that? Well, yeah, as you know, I, I I definitely hit you with a lot of emails. You know, I was uh, right. a big part of it, and uh, you know, you uh, you know, I, I, I to be selected and all those things is just. You know, it really was a it was a great thing because in our world, you know, a lot of times, you know, you don't. It's hard to see, you know, where you're going and to get in a like in a a uh, national honor like that. That feels good. Um, and the reason I felt uh, compelled to uh, apply for it, it, it was initially a colleague that had told me about it, and I saw it, and um, I thought, you know, with with those different stops, and like you said, sometimes it's been a year, it's been a year and a half, you know, and those those, uh, you know, uh, record-breaking things and stuff that we've been able to do, um, I thought, you know, I, I might have enough resume to stack up against some others that uh, that are really, I mean, amazing. I mean, to be a part of that class, these guys are really, really well done. And uh, so I, I just thought I had a shot at it. And, uh, you know, I definitely uh, am eager to continue to learn from other coaches and be kind of uh, – in that realm where you can network and uh, continue to uh, see what this profession can do uh, and the doors that it can open, you know, cause a lot of the, my path, I'm, you know, kind of not being, you know, I didn't play at the best school, didn't do, you know, all this stuff kind of had to, you know, cut, cut a lot of this stuff on my own teeth and, you know, uh, not don't have the, 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 the same mentors that maybe other guys do. And so to kind of, maybe open up those opportunities to talk with other people and learn from them uh, was really the main reason for it. And then uh, the second part, you know, the, the to be a part of something that's so special and you look at the alumni and even the, just our class alone, you know, the impact that, 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 uh, that is occurring with those coaches uh, is something that uh, it just feels uh, like a very, very blessed opportunity to be a part of that. And even to have like just a, just a, 
one of the 35 of those guys that are uh, really, you know, propelling this sport forward. Well, Coach, um, I'm super excited about getting to meet you, you know, in person. I finally face-to-face here on the podcast, but in person down there in uh, San Antonio in January, um, you know, you guys make that this thing special. And, and, and the hard part is, is just finding the right fits and, you know, guys that uh, exemplify what we're looking for. And you, you're definitely one of those those good guys. Um, look forward to keeping up with you guys this season. Thanks so much for hopping on the podcast with, with us. But before you go, if you don't mind sharing your uh, Twitter account, just so coaches can keep up with the journey uh, of the Storm and, um, you know, your, your journey as well. And if they got any questions in relation to this podcast, they can ask you there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's at Coach Murphy. LEC. And again, that's at Coach Murphy LEC. And, uh, you know, any coaches that would want to reach out to me uh, at any level, you know, high school, um, any advice, any new head coaches that are, have some similar challenges that they may be facing, you know, I, I'm, I'm an open book. I'd love to, you know, meet and talk with you guys. And, uh, you know, if there's, if, uh, if I have any advice, uh, I definitely would share it and uh, eager to get, uh, you know, other guidance advice from others as well. So I appreciate you very much. This has been awesome, um, and I, I, I'm I'm excited to go down to San Antonio and you know meet you in person and uh, you know everybody that's going to be a part of this special thing. No doubt, Coach. Once again, great uh, good luck this season. Great meeting you, and uh, look forward to to seeing you in San Antonio. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Inside the Headset. If you heard anything on this episode that you would like to learn more information about, head over to afcapodcast.com where you can find every episode and all of the corresponding show notes. While you're there, take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, please let us know by sending an email to podcast at afca.com. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Inside the Headset and tag it when you share each episode. You can stay up to date with all things AFCA by following the at we are AFCA Twitter account. Every episode of Inside the Headset can also be found on your favorite audio streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are not currently a member of the AFCA, be sure to find us online at AFCA.com and apply to join over 10,000 NFL, college, and high school coaches from around the country who are striving to be the best they can be. With an AFCA membership, you gain invaluable access to the annual AFCA convention, the bi-monthly magazine, and the new and improved digital library, which contains thousands of videos and articles contributed by hundreds of current and former football coaches. You can also visit AFCAinsider.com to sign up for our free weekly email newsletter on the right-hand side of the screen. It comes out every Tuesday at lunch and is filled with great articles and stories written by many of the same coaches you hear on the podcast. It's geared to help you become a better coach tomorrow than you are today. Be sure to connect with me on Twitter at Coach Mario Price. And remember, the AFCA is not just an annual convention. It is an association that continually promotes education, guidance, and networking. But it is also so much more than that. The AFCA is about celebrating the past and educating the future. It is about developing great coaches who will produce great teams and even better people. So invest in your skill set and impact today by engaging with the AFCA.